Thanks for joining us for today's message. You're about to watch a message from Pastor Brennan Beeler in our series titled, Gods and Kings, where Matthew presents Jesus as the one true God and King, in a time where kings wanted to be worshiped as gods. We're always encouraged to hear how God is using this ministry to touch lives. If you have a story to share about how God has been working in your life, would you please let us know and email us at yourstory@regeneratechurch.com. Also, if you would like to help support this ministry financially, you can do so by going online and clicking the giving tab at regeneratechurch.com and help us bring messages like this one every week to people all around the world. Now let's prepare our hearts to hear from God's word. Humpty Dumpty sat on a... Humpty Dumpty had a great... All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty... Back together again. Now, I know what you're thinking. Pastor Brennan, did you just open up your sermon with a mother goose rhyme? But it's not just a mother goose rhyme, you see. For it's what so many people today are experiencing in their lives presently. Things are so broken. Things seem to be so destroyed. So beyond repair that there's no possible way that it could ever be put back together again. And you might say, I've tried. I've tried everything. I've tried all the king's horses, all the king's men. I've tried all the psychiatrists and therapists and counselors and medications and plans and positive thinking and self-help books. I've tried it all. But no matter what I've tried, it seems that I can't put it back together again. It seems to me in culture today that now more than ever before, people are viewing that their marriages are beyond repair. That their families or relationships with friends are beyond repair. That our lives individually are so broken and jacked and cracked that they are beyond repair. We see suicide today at an all-time high in society in our country. We see it go up by over 50% over the last several years. We see it skyrocketing. Why? Because people believe that they are too jacked and too cracked to be able to be put back together again. No matter what you try, no matter who you go to, that there seems to be no help. But let me tell you this today, although all the king's horses and all the king's men and all the other avenues that you would went to to try to get put back together, let me tell you, although the king's horses and king's men couldn't do it, there's the king of kings who can put it back together again. His name is Jesus Christ. And that's what we see in our text today. We left off with Jesus being betrayed by Judas Peter denying Jesus and the rest of his disciples running for their lives. Jesus has been arrested, betrayed in that garden of Gethsemane, taken away into an illegal trial by the Jewish religious leaders, found him guilty because of their jealousy for him. And so they began beating him. That court case, if you will, not really a court case, but an illegal trial in a person's home, the home of Caiaphas, took place throughout the night, and now first thing in the morning around 5 a.m., they're taking Jesus to Pontius Pilate. We pick up the Matthew 27, verse 1. Very early in the morning, the leading priests and elders met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. That was the ultimate goal. They wanted Jesus dead and gone. <laughs> Little did they know, can't keep them down. Hashtag YOLO, hashtag just kidding. Hashtag you don't only live once if you're Jesus. And so they wanted him dead. They wanted him gone. Then they bound him, verse 2. And they led him away and they took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Now notice this, they wanted Jesus dead, but it was illegal in Israel at that time for the Jewish authorities 
to sentence someone to death. Capital punishment was reserved for the Roman government. But that isn't the real reason why they led Jesus to Pilate. For you see, when they wanted someone dead, oftentimes they would just do it. They dragged that woman in John chapter 8 out of her home and they were ready to stone her. They were ready to kill her right there on the spot. But Jesus saved her, of course. Then in Acts chapter 8, we see, we see Philip, or excuse me, Stephen, we see Stephen stoned to death. And, and so they, they took his life right there. And, and Paul, we know, who was formerly known as Saul, was holding the coats of those who were stoning him to death. Interesting. When they wanted someone dead, oftentimes the Jewish leaders would just do it. So it's not just because of the Roman rule that they brought Jesus to Pilate, but they took Jesus to the Roman governor because it had to be that way for three reasons. You can write them down. Number one, to fulfill Bible prophecy. See, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, it says that the Messiah would be pierced or pierced through for our sin, our transgression, our wrongdoings. The Messiah had to be pierced for our wrongdoings. The Romans were the only ones that crucified. When the Jewish people wanted someone dead, they would stone them. And so Jesus, to fulfill prophecy, it had to be that way. Now catch this, Psalms 22 describes exactly how the Messiah would die, describing crucifixion to a T, perfectly, hundreds of years before crucifixion was ever invented. Before it was even created, that form of torture to put someone to death, through the psalmist, God prophesied exactly how the Messiah would die. So Jesus had to be taken to the Roman governor because Jesus had to be put to death that way. Now to the disciples, Jesus being arrested, then handed over to Pontius Pilate, it seemed like everything was falling apart. But with God's economy, things weren't falling apart. Things were falling into place. Things weren't going out of control. And I want to tell you today, when things seem like they are out of control in your life, God is still in control. Do you believe that today? God is in control. And so it had to be that way. Jesus had to be crucified not only to fulfill Bible prophecy, but number two, to depict Bible typology. You see, hundreds of thousands of Israelites, as they were wandering in the wilderness, after they were delivered out of Egypt for 40 years, they're in the wilderness. But they rejected God's instruction. They were in rebellion to God. And so God took his hand of protection off of his people and allowed poisonous snakes to enter into the camp. These poisonous snakes began to strike and bite people. And because of the venom, people were dying because of their sin and rebellion to God. And so when people came back and they confessed to Moses, we have sinned, we've rebelled against God. God told Moses in Numbers chapter 21 verses 8 and 9. Then the Lord says to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now God tells Moses, here's what you're to do. I want you to fashion a bronze serpent on a pole, put it high up on a pole in the middle of the camp. And so that anytime someone is smitten by the serpent, they can look to this bronze statue that's been lifted up and they will be healed miraculously and they will live. You see, because of our sin, 
the serpent, Satan, comes in and injects his poison of bitterness and guilt and shame. And then this is what our focus is on, our failure, our sin, our shame. Satan trips you up and then he wants to beat you while you're down. That's his strategy. And so when we are smitten by the serpent, when we've done something wrong, when we've tripped up, we fall, oftentimes that's where our focus is, isn't it? We can't take our eyes off of the snake bite where Satan got us to mess up, where, where Satan got to us. And so we focus on our shame. We focus on our guilt. We focus on our mistakes. But when we look to the snake bite, when we focus on those things, we will miss the healing that Jesus wants to offer to us in our lives. You see, we have to take our eyes off of the snake bite and lift our eyes up and put them on the cross. What do I mean? Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to him, he was a religious leader, he was part of these religious leaders. But he noticed what Jesus was teaching was true, so Nicodemus snuck out at nighttime and came to Jesus to talk to him about these things. He was trying to keep a low profile. And so Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. It's the first case we ever see Nick at night. And so it was the first time that was ever aired. And so Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus and they have this conversation and Jesus is explaining these truths to him. And Jesus says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now I know you've heard of John three sixteen before. Many of you can quote that verbatim from your heart. You've, you've committed it to memory. But did you know that the context of what Jesus is talking about in John 3, 16, that you would not perish but have everlasting life, is in context with Jesus, just as the bronze serpent was lifted up in the middle of that camp, so too, Jesus says, that only depicts, that's a depiction, an illustration of me, the son of man, who would be lifted up. And you might say, wait a minute, Jesus, it's a serpent on that pole. I thought the serpent represents Satan. It does. The serpent represents Satan. Then why is the serpent on the pole? Because Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. As the world's sin was placed upon him when he was on the cross. To bring healing to us from our sin. So Jesus is lifted up. And if we would just take our eyes off of the serpent's bite, the stronghold, the area in our life that the enemy is wreaking havoc in and the poison is flowing through, the bitterness, the envy, the anger, whatever that is that the enemy is injecting into you, if you would just take your eyes off the shame and the guilt of your past mistakes and lift your eyes up a little bit higher and you put them on the cross where Jesus Christ hung and died and pronounced over those things, it is forgiven. It is gone. It is washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Then you would realize Jesus is your healer. He's the healer of the shame, the guilt. He is the bondage breaker. And he is the chain remover. All because of what he has done on the cross. When you have the poison of your guilt, you come and say at the foot of the cross, I have sinned. It wasn't until these Israelites confessed that they were in rebellion to God, confessed their sin before God, that God was able to give the instructions of healing. But when you come to a point in your life when you realize, you know what, I have sinned. I have done wrong 
in God's sight and I need to be healed and freed from this, then you look to what Christ has done on the cross and the poison of the serpent no longer has an effect on us. There is healing given when you look to Jesus on the cross. Lift up your eyes. Behold, you will see him. Whether you get healed miraculously, whether you're healed completely, we know that the poison will no longer have the effect it did on our lives. You know what's so amazing about this illustration is, do you know in our society what the medical symbol is for healing? I brought it in. I want to show it to you. The medical symbol for healing is this image right here. It's a bronze snake. Bronze snake on a bronze pole. That's the medical sign for healing. And then you know what is on every ambulance driver's badge? You just saw it. We'll put it back up there. The snake on a pole lifted up. Across our society, people universally recognize that very thing as the symbol that would bring healing, the medical symbol that represents healing taking place is Jesus Christ, the only one who truly can bring healing. Now, we have to realize today, when we see things like that, it helps me realize that Christ is really the one that heals for anyone who needs a, needs a healing touch from anyone who needs to be freed from the pain of their past, anyone that needs to have the guilt and shame removed, all you have to do is look to Jesus and you realize when you see Jesus on the cross, him who was lifted up, him who took our place, when you see that, you realize if Christ loves me enough to die for me, you realize I am loved. If Christ would value me that much, you no longer struggle with self-worth because the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe and God Almighty was willing to give his own life for you personally so that he could choose you because he selected you, he adopted you. You are a son or daughter of the King. You have great value. If you struggle with self-worth, you realize you have worth. If you struggle with not being loved, you realize you are loved. When you realize your shame and your guilt that keeps you back from stepping forward in your relationship with God because Satan oftentimes will try to use your past mistakes to keep you from moving forward. Come on, somebody. That's the strategy of the enemy. But God breaks those chains. He removes your shame so that you can move forward and step into all that God has for you. That's what Christ can do when we simply behold him on the cross. All you have to do is look to Jesus. So Christ had to go to the cross, not only to fulfill Bible prophecy and to depict Bible typology, but number three, portraying guilt for all humanity. You see, all the soldiers that were in the Praetorium Guard, the ones that were responsible for carrying out the orders of crucifying Jesus Christ, it would be easy to blame one group of people and some people try to do it. They try to blame the Jews because they are Christ killers and they use racial slurs and slanders about Jewish people, God's chosen people. Or the Romans, it would be easy just to blame the Roman people where they were the ones that actually did it so we can blame the Romans. But it's interesting in the Praetorium Guard, people from the entire Roman Empire were drafted and brought there from all regions, all walks of life, all nationalities, all ethnicities, all backgrounds to depict that not one people group are responsible for the life and death of Jesus Christ. But everyone is guilty because it was our sin that Jesus went to the cross for. No one killed Jesus without Jesus first giving permission and allowing it to be that way. Jesus even said, we saw in Matthew 26, 
when Peter pulled out the sword and started swiping people's ears off. She said, don't you realize I could call angels down from heaven and be delivered and wipe all these people out? Don't you realize the power of God? Jesus could have taken himself off the cross at any moment he wanted to. He could have said, I've had enough of this. These people cursing me and mocking me, spitting on me. You know what? Forget this. Boom, he could have been off the cross. He could have called down a legion of angels to surround him and take him down. But it wasn't those nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was his love for us that held Jesus to the cross. The nails didn't hold Jesus to the cross. It was for the sake of our sin being forgiven and God wanting to restore us into a right relationship with him. That's what kept him on the cross. The Bible declares that Jesus went to the cross enduring the shame for the prize that was set before him. The prize that was set before him was seeing you in heaven with him restored. God just wanting his family together again sees you as the prize. You are the reason that he stayed on the cross. So don't ever fall into blaming a certain people group because we are all guilty, portraying the guilt for all humanity. So Jesus now is taken to Pontius Pilate. Meanwhile, verse 3, when Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and the elders. I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care, they retorted. That's your problem. Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. The leading priests picked up the coins. They said it wouldn't be right to put this money in the temple treasury. They said, since it was payment for murder. Notice that. After some discussion, they finally decided to buy the potter's field. And they made it into a cemetery for foreigners. And that is why the field is still called the field of blood. This fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah that says, They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price at which he was valued by the people of Israel, and purchased the potter's field as the Lord directed. Now, if anyone could have found fault in Jesus, it would have been Judas. Because Judas was looking for a reason to betray Jesus. He was looking for something that he didn't like in Jesus. If anyone would have been able to find fault in Jesus, it would have been Judas. But Judas here acknowledges that Jesus was innocent. So he throws the 30 pieces of silver that was given to him as payment to betray Jesus and set Jesus up for his arrest. And he throws that down in the temple floor. And then he goes out and hangs himself. Notice Judas' response. When he's filled with guilt and remorse, he ends his life. Peter also, in the end of Matthew 26, left with guilt and remorse. He was exceedingly sorrowful, it declared. And that's how the chapter ended. And the next time we see Peter, he's back in his old lifestyle fishing, went back to his old lifestyle, his old stomping ground, doing the old things before that he used to do before Jesus called him by name. But because Peter didn't end his life, Jesus sought Peter out and redeemed Peter, restored Peter, and recommissioned him into ministry. So many times when we are filled with remorse, We think that there is no hope for forgiveness. There's no hope for redemption. Both Peter and Judas in their own ways betrayed Jesus. They were both filled with sorrow. They were both filled with exceeding remorse in their life. But one person decided that there was no hope left. And one person decided to continue going on with life. And the person that decided to continue going on in life was a person that found themselves being redeemed and restored by Jesus. 
which shows me in a very simple but powerful way that no one is ever beyond the hope and power of redemption by Jesus Christ. That we would ever get to a point where we think it's over. Because when Jesus is involved, nothing is ever over. Jesus is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. And he has it all planned out. He's, he's got us in his hands and he holds all things together. All we have to do is walk and keep walking and know that Jesus will get us to where we need to be. And then the religious leaders, they also acknowledged it was murder because Jesus was innocent. They also declared that the innocence of Jesus, not only Judas declares the innocence of Jesus, but the religious leaders also acknowledged the innocence of Jesus by confessing that this money, it's, it's blood money. And we can't put it into the tithe boxes. We can't take it into the temple treasury because it's blood money. It's dirty money. We can't, we can't use that. So they didn't know what to do with it. So they had a conversation, what should we do with it? And they went out and they used the money to buy a potter's field. Now a potter's field was land that surrounded a potter's house and was land that was completely useless for anything. Because if a vessel became cracked or marred, the potter would take water first and try to repair that mar, that crack. And he would work water back into this hardened clay to try to soften it so that it would be moldable and shapeable again. But if the clay refused the working of the potter to work water back into the clay and it resisted the touch of the master's hands and the pot was cracked beyond repair, unworkable, unusable, the potter would throw it out into the field. Being a master potter was a trade that was handed down from generation to generation. So this house that was a potter's house would be used as a place from generation to generation. So the field around it over time would have so much broken pots in the field that you could not farm it, that you could not cultivate it, you could not build upon it. It was good for nothing except to be a potter's field. You couldn't do anything with it. It was useless. And that's what was purchased with the blood money of Jesus. The reason why that's significant for you and me today is because it speaks exactly of what Jesus can do, has done, and will do for us. Jeremiah chapter 18, God likens himself to the master potter and us, our lives, as the clay. You see, clay is a common substance, isn't it? It's just dirt. And the clay that's taken has no value, no worth. It's, it's relatively worthless until the master potter starts working water into the clay to soften the hardened clay. And God does the same with our lives. He picks us up and he starts working the word of God, which the Bible declares is the water of the word. He works the word into us and the word of God begins to soften us, begins to prepare our hearts, work within our lives and soften us to what he wants to do. And then the, the, the master potter, he places his hands on us and we say, oh God, I can feel your touch on my life. I can feel your presence. It feels so good to be in your arms. And then the master potter begins to place pressure and squeeze a little bit. And we think, what are you doing? It was so nice when you just put your hand on me, but now there's some pressure involved. And I don't like being under pressure. I don't like going through these situations that cause me this, this struggle and this hardship and this pressure in my life. I, I don't want to be in, in this pressure. I, I don't want to have this pressure in my life until that pressure from the master's touch forms us and shapes us and molds us 
into something that is of a great value to the master. And then he takes us off that potter's wheel and he begins to carry us and we think, oh, finally, I'm off the wheel of life, that hamster wheel. It feels like I'm going round and round and round in circles. And it feels like I'm not getting anywhere. It's just the same problem and then pressure and then problem and then pressure. I'm just going in circles. But finally, God scooped me up and picked me up and now is carrying me and I'm in the arms of God and I feel his arms of love wrapped around me and he's carrying me on to completion and then you hear the door of the kiln swing open. And then he places you in the fire. No, what are you doing? I, I like being in your arms better. I don't want to be in the fire. But we realize that in the fire, it's where you are solidified. It's where you are strengthened. It's where you create the, the fervor to keep going in the way that the master potter has shaped you in. And so he places you in the kiln and, and you're there and the heat is turned up, but it only firms you up to be able to stand fast in the difficulties and trials that will come into your life. And we think, why are you doing this, Lord? But the Lord is doing this so that you're not a worthless lump of clay, but he wants to make you into something that is priceless an expensive vase. If it's cheap, it's a vase. But if it's expensive, it's a vase. And so Christ takes us through this process of shaping us and molding us to make us into who he's created us to be so that we have value and that we can be used as a vessel for the master's purposes. But if that clay refuses the touch of the master, if it resists the pressure, if it repels the water of the word that's trying to be worked into it, and it doesn't form and mold and be shaped by the potter's hands, if it's unworkable and unusable, or perhaps blemished or cracked beyond repair, no longer receiving the softening and the working of the master, the potter would then take that clay and throw it out. If that's the way you're going to be, you're useless, you're unusable, you're unworkable, and he throws it out into the potter's field. Notice this, though, because maybe some of you feel that that's where you are at today. After what I've done in resisting the work of God in my life, after what I've done, I've been so marred, blemished. After what I've done in my life, I don't know how I could ever come under the hands of the master. I don't know how God could ever shape me and mold me after, after what I've done. And maybe some of you today feel that that's where you've been in your life and you've been thrown into the potter's field. Well, the most useless piece of property or the most useless pots, the cracked pots, the potheads, whatever type of pot it is, the most useless property where the most useless cracked pots were, the most trashed, broken, ruined, destroyed vessels were purchased by the blood money of Jesus Christ. So even when it was thrown out, what Jesus has done by his blood, he bought back that what was once wasted and useless. Do you see the symbolism and the power in that? That, that by the blood money of Jesus Christ, your life, no matter how broken, no matter how far removed, no matter how far from God, that the blood money of Jesus Christ bought you back. He redeemed you. He purchased you. He still wants you. 
You see, you might feel that you are a crackpot, but Jesus Christ was crucified for crackpots. You might feel that you're a waste and that there's no value to you, that, that there's just, you're worthless because of the condition you're in. You look to the cross and you realize that Jesus Christ died for you. His blood paid the price for you. We were bought with the blood money of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, that you were bought with a price. 1 Peter 1, 18, the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The plan has always been redemption. No matter how far gone you've been, God's plan was always to buy you back. The most trashed, broken, ruined, destroyed crackpots has been purchased by the blood money of Jesus Christ. The price that was paid was Jesus' blood that bought back the potter's field. I don't belong in the house, you may say. I don't, I don't feel like I'm in the hands of the potter presently. I deserve to be cast out from the master. My life is ruined, destroyed, and useless. But with the blood money, the useless was purchased. And Jesus, the only one who could take broken pieces of our lives and put them back together again. When all the king's horses and all the king's men and all the psychiatrists and counselors and therapists and medications all couldn't put you back together again, you realize the blood of Jesus Christ has the power to heal. He bought the potter's field and he can take your broken life and he can some way miraculously in a way that you might not understand how he can. And I, looking at you, don't know how he can either. But somehow, through the blood of Jesus Christ, that by the shedding of his blood, healing was released. The Bible declares that by his stripes, we are healed. When his skin was broken open and blood began to shed, healing was released. And that our lives supernaturally, miraculously, no matter how far gone they have been or are presently, that he cares about the crackpots enough where his life redeemed the potter's field. And all the broken vessels, all the humpty dumpties, everyone that's had their lives falling apart it seems like it's impossible to come back together again. When those lives are placed in Jesus' hands, Jesus has a way to bring it back together again. He has a way. The Bible declares that in his hands, all things are held together. All we have to do is place our life in his hands. If today you haven't yet placed your life in his hands, you might wonder, well, what does that even mean? It's simply accepting Jesus Christ and the work that he's done on the cross. You see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, it was that none would perish, but that all would have everlasting life. That's Christ's heart for the world. But Christ won't force himself upon anyone, nor will he make anybody receive him, but he has given mankind a free choice that you have the ability to receive the forgiveness and the healing that he offers to be made whole again, or you can reject that. But if you are here today and you would be one that would say, you know what, I wanna receive that healing touch in my life. My marriage perhaps is broken. Maybe my family is falling apart. Maybe there's a relationship with a friend that you've been distanced and separated from. Maybe it's your own life that you just don't see how your own life could be put back together again. But then you look to the cross. You realize Jesus was the one that was lifted up. You take your eyes off the snake bite and you put them on Jesus who was lifted up to offer healing for anyone who would lift their eyes to Jesus on the cross 
look to him, you would receive forgiveness. So I want to give you an opportunity today, if you are here, you haven't yet received the forgiveness that only Jesus Christ can offer. I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to him. And when you do, no longer Humpty Dumpty who sat on a wall, no longer Humpty Dumpty who had a great fall, no longer Humpty Dumpty that no one could put back together again, but now you are who Christ created you to be, putting you back together again and making you whole. That's what Jesus Christ can do in your life. Jesus Christ has the power to redeem. He has the power to restore. He has the power to heal. The song, I got the power, it's written about Jesus Christ. He's got the power. Look to him. Stop looking to yourself. Put your eyes off your snake bite and put them on the cross and watch how Christ will make you whole. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us for today's powerful message in our series titled, Gods and Kings. If you'd like to help support this ministry financially, you can do so by going online and clicking the giving tab at regeneratechurch.com and help us continue to bring messages like this one every week to people all around the world. We'll see you later, guys. God bless.